Our next speaker is uh, Gamal Din El Sayed. He's a researcher at Google Brain, finished his PhD at uh, Columbia University in theoretical neuroscience, I believe, originally from Egypt. And I know previously I introduced a, a math Olympiad that was Melanie. Uh, Gamal is actually a, a, an Olympic athlete, right? In, in, um, in fencing, representing Egypt. So uh, yeah, and, and also a researcher. So it's an interesting combination. So Gamal, please feel free to take it away. The stage is yours. He'll be speaking about adversarial examples for humans. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for having me. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here in this great workshop. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Gamal. Uh, so today I wanna to talk about some of the experiments we have been doing at Google in the past two years, trying to study similarities and differences between computer and vision models and our uh, visual system. So one of the things that I've been interested in is studying the failure mode of computer vision models and then compare those to humans. And as many of you may know, uh, one of the most intriguing uh, failure modes of computer vision is adversarial examples, which have been brought up by many people in the past six years or so. As many of me may know, um, adversarial examples are those inputs that are designed by our adversary to make a machine learning models make wrong predictions. And in particular in computer vision, people have shown that you can add very small perturbation to images. Um, and this perturbation could, for example, make a convolution network, um, just make any prediction you want. So this is one of the most famous Panda images, I guess, in the field, um, where in this work, people added just very small perturbation that is less than 1% of the intensity level of the pixels. And then the network here is switching prediction from a Panda to a given. So maybe switching prediction from Panda to a given is not a big issue, but for example, in this work, if you switch prediction from a stop sign to a kite, that can be a very big problem. So that's why these adversarial examples pose uh, safety and security concerns, and that's why it's really important to study their properties. So I guess when adversarial examples first brought up, um, it has been always thought that these are unique failure modes to these computer vision models. And one of the things I've been interested in is studying uh, actually if humans can be susceptible to the same uh, mistakes that these models are making. So generally these adversarial examples um, are generated by an optimization process that requires um, access to model parameters and architecture. And it may seem initially um, not possible to transfer these to humans as we don't have access to the human brain. However, there has been some signs or clues that this transfer is actually possible from like different works in adversarial examples in the field. And the first clue here is these black box adversarial attacks. So generally, um, you can transfer or create invariance to models and then attack a, a model that you don't have access to by using ensembling techniques. So for example, if you include um, different models with different architectures, trained with different data or trained with different loss function, you're more likely to attack a model that you don't have access to. So the second clue here is um, these adversarial examples when made invariant to transformation. So those more strong adversarial examples that appear in the physical world uh, sometimes show features that are relevant to our visual system. And here I have two examples of this. So the first example here is this adversarial poster. And the goal here was to design a poster that can be printed in the physical world and then can be viewed by a model. And then no matter what viewing condition or angle, this model is gonna predict a computer label rather than a cat label here. And if you look closely here, you can see that by making this invariance to spatial transformations, you can see that this poster is creating or generated some books like feature which may resemble a desktop computer here. So even more interesting is, is this work, uh, which is called adversarial patch. So in this work, the goal was to design a patch that you can just throw in front of any computer vision model. And then the model would just ignore any object it's seeing and predicting anything as being a toaster, right? So any model is just gonna be absolutely confident seeing a toaster no matter what object is seeing here. And if you look closely to this uh, patch, you can see that this patch is actually having poster features. For example, it has these two openings here. Um, so it's having these poster features um, by doing this optimization on these models. So again, our hypothesis here is that these strong adversarial examples um, that are generated and transfer across these computer vision models, uh, the target feature that are relevant to our visual system and thus they can transfer to us um, as humans. And the aim here is to identify what context can we detect the effects of these adversarial examples in humans. And again, discuss two projects or two experiments 
that we have done in the past two years uh, to try to quantify and in investigate um, uh, this hypothesis. So the first work here um, is a paper that appeared two years ago in Europe. Uh, so this paper is with Shriya Shankar, Brian Chung, Nicholas Pippernoth, Alex Kirken, and Ian Goodfellow, and Joshua Sulbitson. And the main goal of this paper is to actually try to address um, the mismatch between computer vision models and our visual system. And then try to ask this question of whether I example transfer to human in this reduced setting where we address the mismatch between the two systems. So the testing methodology here um, is basically to start first um, by addressing the difference in the initial or early visual processing, then address the architecture difference between the two systems, then generate as say, examples using these black box um, um, methods, and then make humans evaluate the accuracy of images of these images and see if humans would make the same mistakes um, that these models are making. So let me comment here about um, this mismatch between um, computer vision models and our visual system. So there are two major differences here. Um, and the first one is this early visual processing, right? So usually in computer vision models, you would have a convolution network, for example, it would take a grid of pixels and then layer by layer is gonna transform this um, to create like high level representations of this input image. Whereas our brain doesn't work in the same way. So we have our eyes, which have phobia, right? So it doesn't have resolution across all the input seen, but it have high resolution in the center and then the resolution drops out. So in order to account for that difference, we incorporated a layer early for these models that's actually doing this spatial based blurring. So the second um, major difference is feedback as many have talked about today. So feedback is a very important aspect of our visual system. And most of the computer vision models we have um, are these like heat forward architectures. So in order to address that difference, we use ideas for psychophysics to try to limit the presentation time and using backward masking to try to limit the feedback process of our brain and then make our visual system uh, functions more like a feed forward system. So apart from these two differences, we just use standard ways of generating adversarial examples um, that people use in the field, which I'm gonna mention in a second. All right, so this process starts first with the data set that have rich classes, for example, ImageNet. And then what we do first is we try to group um, like these thousand classes to classes that people are familiar with. For example, we create three image groups here. For example, a Petsy group is including all images of cats and dogs. Hazard group includes images of spiders and snakes. Vegetables group include images of broccoli and cabbages. And then what we do is do this ensembling technique to try to create perturbation that fool all models together. And the way to do this is simply create uh, or compute the probability distribution uh, or probability of predicting a target class. Say, for example, you start with a cat image, you compute the probability of a dog image, and then you just use is this iterative um, optimization process that take gradient steps with respect to the input, such that the whole ensemble of models here would increase its probability of prediction to a dog class. So it's a very simple optimization process, gradient-based optimization. Um, yeah, nothing fancy here. So one comment in this also is, um, generally you'd have a constraint on the scale of these perturbations so that um, the final image is very similar to the, um, the clean image. Um, yeah. So we took this image and we, then we run this uh, two alternative force choice experiment. Um, so in this experiment, we had 38 subjects they sit in front of a screen. And then for each experiment, um, it's basically choosing between two classes for the different image groups, as I, I mentioned. So if subjects are doing the pets group, they're gonna just choose between cats and dogs. So the test structure starts as follows. So it starts with a fixation um, period. And then we briefly present images for 60 to 70 milliseconds. And then we follow the presentation here by high contrast mask. And again, the idea of this brief presentation and the masking is to try to reduce um, the feedback processing of our visual system to these images. And then we record um, the chosen class of the image and peak or action time. So the conditions that we showed in this experiment are as follows. So we start first by showing uh, clean images just to get the baseline of peak accuracy in this task. And then the second condition is this adversarial images, which is basically say, take a cat image and then perturb it to be a dog. 
And then we had one control here, which we call flip control. And the goal of this control is to control for the scale of the perturbations. So to, to just to see if any degradation in performance is basically due to these added noise or there's more structure to this. Uh, so basically simply just take the difference between adversarial and clean images, and then you take the perturbation, flip it, um, and then put it back on the image. So the effect of this on the, mo in, on the models is it that um, it actually deactivates the adversarial effect. So for example, if you show this image to a computer vision model, it's gonna predict this cat as a dog, but then simply by just flipping the perturbations, the model is gonna go back to predict this image as being cat again. And then the final condition here is this false um, images. So this is basically an image from a third class. For example, if we're doing the cat versus dog classification experiment, this could be a car image, for example. And then some of the time we perturb this to be a dog and some of the time perturb it to be a cat. And then we ask whether humans would make a similar prediction to what we have here. So let's first look at the results for this false condition. So as I just mentioned here, subject cannot choose the true class of the image. They just can't choose cats and dogs and then you show this car to them. So if the adversary perturbation have no effect on humans, you would expect to get um, like one of two patterns. One is just people would just report randomly um, cats and dogs. And then if this is the case, the probability of the target class would be at 0.5. So this is our chance level. And the second scenario is like people like cats, they're just gonna press cats all the time or like dogs, they're gonna press dogs all the time. But then because we perturb these images with equal probability to cat and dog, also this would average to 0.5. And what we see here is across all the image groups that we have run in this experiments is that there's a significant shift in human perception towards the target class that we specify with our attack. So what this means is that it's more likely that people are gonna report this image as a dog, right? If we add a perturbation that is specific to the dog class and vice versa, if we added the perturbation that is specific to the cat class. So even more interestingly, if we can divide this, divide this metric just based on the human's reaction time in this task, where in the left here, you get the fast reaction time and here's the long responses. You can see that this also depends uh, on the reaction time. So humans are more biased toward the target class as they report this uh, more quickly. So now let's go back um, to the other conditions where subject here can truly choose the, the original class of the image. So here, people can choose the true class, right? And if we look at the results here, comparing the adversarial images with respect to the clean images, you can see that there's a reduced uh, accuracy of human report to the true class, but that is not very interesting because this could be just because these images are more noisy. What's more interesting here is to compare um, the flip con condition here with the adversarial um, examples. And what you can see also there's a reduced uh, accuracy for the adversarial compared to the flip control, which shows that the adversarial example actually in this time limited presentation in this 60 millisecond sitting, they transfer to humans. So um, there was some limitation of this study and one of them is in this experiment, because we have uh, um, this like very fast presentation, um, we needed to increase the perturbation to make them very um, obvious to humans. So presentation, so perturbation had a uh, very large magnitude compared to those that full computer vision models. So here we use 32 out of 256 in the L-infinity norm, whereas models can be fooled usually with perturbation that is even less than eight. Um, out of 256. So the second um, um, limitation here is that we could only demonstrate this effect only in this time limited presentation. So this was a very key uh, to the success of this transfer to humans. And uh, let me show you here an example. So, so this is an image of a spider that we perturb it to be a snake. And then in this time limited presentation setting, uh, about 70% of the people thought this image is a snake. But now if you just take a look at this image, no one is gonna classify this as a snake. Everyone is gonna say this is a spider. So in this next study, I'm gonna um, discuss a new experiment that we conducted to try to see if we can change the task and see we can measure whether we can measure uh, the influence of small adversarial perturbation in this time unlimited setting. 
So this is a new work that is led by Vijay Viradran, which is an excellent student that is interning with, with us this year. Um, and his joint work with John Schlins, Mike Moser, Jasha, and myself. Okay, so the main idea here is in this like original classification task, it was really hard to measure the effects of smoke perturbation in this time um, unlimited settings. So in here, we're trying to investigate whether we can change the task so we can detect these subtle effects of the adversarial perturbations. And the testing methodology is quite similar. So we start first also by matching the initial visual processing by adding this fovea layer. And then what we do differently is we design a adversarial perturbation now with different scales. So now we can like have very small perturbations and very large perturbations. Then we measure human per perception across these different uh, perturbation scales. And the key difference here is the task, right? So in here, we didn't use classification task. Instead, we use a comparison task. So instead of just showing one image, we show two images and then ask people to compare across these two images, which I'm going to discuss in a second. Yeah, so this is the new task. Um, so basically here, the task have a specific class. So in this case, it's with respect to the cat class. And then what we do is we show two images side by side to humans. And these two images are perturbed in different ways. And then we ask humans whether, which image is more cat-like, right? And then what we uh, need or what we want to see from this is if these perturbations are changing model confidence in different ways, the model is going to be more confident in one um, class or one image as being more cat-like than the other. And then we can measure the alignment of human um, comparison tasks to these models. Um, yeah, so this is an m study study uh, where we recorded 100 subjects. And then we just recorded the images they choose um, um, versus right versus left here. So the different um, perturbation settings that we used here um, is shown in this slide. So first perturbation condition is plus cat, which is basically taking an image and then increasing the model confidence uh, in the cat class. And minus cat is the opposite. It's just um, doing this again, iterative optimization to reduce the model confidence to the cat class. And then we have the plus dog perturbation. So this is a perturbation that increases model confidence in a different class than the experiment class. And then what we do is we pair uh, these conditions. So again, we had the false images, which is not cats and dogs. And then what we do is we pair plus dog and plus cat, right? So if you show plus dog and plus cat to the model, the model is more confident in cat class in the plus cat more than plus dog. So the model would choose plus cat. And then what we measure is whether humans would actually make the same choice. So the other condition here is plus cat and flip plus, which is similar to the previous experiments. So here we use also the flip control to try to deactivate um, the adversary effect um, on models. And then, for example, here, the model would predict with high confidence plus cat more than flip plus. And then we see if humans are actually going to make the same um, uh, choice here. We also had um, conditions where um, images starts from the true class, which is the cat class here. And then what we did is we generated perturbation that would decrease the model confidence in cat. So this is minus cat perturbation. And then we had also the flip control. And then we paired these two conditions and then showed them side by side to humans and asked them which one is more cat-like. And in this case, the model would predict flip minus to be more cat-like than minus cat. Right? because this is decreasing the model confidence in cat, uh, in cat um, class. And you can see also we varied the scale of these perturbations. So here you have very small subtle differences or subtle perturbations. And here you have a uh, large perturbation similar to what I have in the previous experiment. So now let's look at the first conditions here, which is plus cat plus dog, right? So in this condition, as I mentioned, the model would predict plus cat to be more cat-like than plus dog. And then if we look at human um, alignment with the model across the different perturbation scales, we can see a small evidence that there's some alignment here, but it's not very reliable. And that's presumably could be because there is some shared um, features between the cat and dog class. So both are animate classes. So people could confuse more features of cats and dogs. 
So what's more interesting is this plus cat and flip plus conditions. And again, the flip is this control that would just mismatch the perturbation to the image and would deactivate the adversary effects on models. So the model here would predict plus cat to be more cat-like than the flip plus. And what we see here is a very significant effect across all epsilon values. So even we could detect this effect at perturbation scale of two out of 256. So this is very small perturbation. It's less than 1% of the range of the uh, intensity levels here. So it's very small. And yet we can see that humans significantly are choosing um, plus cat to be more cat-like than the flip plus control. So this shows that in this comparison task, we can uncover the influence of Brissette examples uh, in humans, which is similar to the models. So another thing here we can um, do is to look at the true class um, conditions. So again, this is the condition where we start from the cat image, and then we ask people which image is more cat-like, and then we reduce um, uh, the confidence models in the cat class by adding this negative cat perturbations, and we have the flip control as well. And then we can, we can, what we can see here is this effect is also consistent in this condition. So we can also measure uh, a significant bias in human perception in, in this condition as well. So just to summarize, um, so in these two experiments, what we have uh, been trying to uh, validate is this hypothesis that there's an example that's strongly transfer between computer vision models, they also transfer to humans. And what we showed with these experiments is that these adversarial perturbation that cause this significant change in model prediction, they can also influence human perception in both these brief presentation uh, of a single image or in this extended view in conditions where we uh, compare experiments rather than classifying images. So I think these experiments show that uh, the decision boundary of our visual system is very surprisingly similar to this of ensemble of convolution neural networks. However, one thing um, that they haven't mentioned is that the effect here is much smaller than the effect on models, right? So we can detect significant effects, but these effects are very small, whereas models will be completely confused by these perturbations. So this shows that there is still um, a lot of work to be done here to make these models more robust uh, and similar to our visual system. So that's all I have. Um, yeah, thank you very much.